We have two scripture readings today. The first is from Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, and then we will move over to John 21, verses 15 to 19. So going, starting with Matthew 28. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now moving on to John 21, verses 15 to 19. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me? More than these. Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, Take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, Do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, Feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, Follow me. Good morning. So, we've been working on a series, and this is the last one, working through these four different chairs, and we're at the last one, the friend chair. And we've, it's all been about discipleship. Been asking this question the whole time, why am I talking about discipleship? Uh, well, first off, it is a command from Christ. Uh, Matthew 28, we have already heard, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Uh, and then, secondly, uh, it's kind of a result of our focused ministry stuff. A few months ago, a number of leaders met together, um, and we were trying to figure out where should we be focusing our attention in the church. What should our focused ministries be? And we came up with a few things. There was Operation Front Porch, mentoring, and real-life issues. If you want to hear more, you can come and talk to a staff or someone else. Uh, you can figure out what those are. But all of those, to me, kind of pointed to discipleship. There's a need for discipleship. Uh, because you see, discipleship is evangelism. It is mentoring. It is developing relationships. It is all of these things, and yet it's so much more than just those. And it made me think, well, we really need a definition of what discipleship is. So I proposed a, this working definition, and I've had some people talk to me about it, uh, and kind of came up with uh, discipleship is training others towards a deeper relationship with Christ. Uh, and still, it kind of left me thinking, well, how do we then train people towards Christ? How do we uh, invite them into this relationship and teach them how to be disciples? So I started doing some research and I came across a book by Dan Spader called Four Chair Discipling. And that's what I've based this whole series off of. And we've been working through each one of these chairs per week. Now Spader uses uh, chairs to represent his different stages. He does this for a couple of reasons. Chairs, they're invitational, so they invite you to imagine yourself in these chairs. 
so as we work through this last chair today, uh, we'll also do a recap. I just want to imagine want to invite you to imagine yourself in these chairs. Ask yourself, where am I sitting in these chairs? How do I progress or how do I help others progress? And the chairs also remove the linear thinking with stages. Uh, I had one person ask me last week, so why are these three chairs separate over here? Well, this, these three chairs kind of represent the Christian and this is the unbeliever. But the thing about chairs is that it's not so linear you can move from one to the other very easily. So just because this person's here doesn't mean that they're not as Christian as this person. They're all Christian, but we can move around within those. And sometimes our relationship with God, it's a journey. So it's not as strong as one day as it might be the next. So the four chairs, just very briefly, uh, they're... Uh, Along with each chair, there's an invitation. There's the seeker, the invitation that Christ said was, come and see, come check out what I'm doing. With the believer, come follow me. So it's don't just see what I'm doing, but actually get in line, uh, come actually follow. The worker, uh, that one, what was it? Take up your cross, there we go. Take up your cross and follow me. So there's actually some work to do now. And then finally with the friend, Go and bear fruit. And that comes from John 15, which I'll actually be referring to quite a bit today. I'll read a short passage from there as well. Uh, but there, Jesus finally calls his disciples his friends. Now, just a bit of review for those of you who uh, have maybe missed a sermon or two. It is summer. I understand people aren't here. So we're going to go over the three chairs very briefly, and then we'll get into the last chair, the friend. Uh, We've been following the same outline uh, each week. We've talked about who are they, who's the person in each individual chair. We looked at the process models, that is, how did Christ model discipleship to these people, to the people in those specific chairs. We talked about the needs of the people. And then some principles for ministry, so how do we get them to progress to the next chair. And lastly, I gave you some challenges. So just a quick recap on each one. The seeker. Uh, who they are is the unbeliever or the spiritually dead person, someone who doesn't yet know the saving grace of God or someone who's walked away from that. Uh, Christ modeled he, the invitation again was come and see. And he developed relationships with the seekers and then he would challenge them to move to the next chair. Some of their needs, they need genuine relationships uh, with people, people to invest in their lives. Uh, and then they need the gospel to be presented to them in a meaningful way through that relationship. We talked about six principles for ministry for the seeker. Uh, one of my highlights was the spiritual CPR. If they're spiritually dead, they need CPR to be revived. Uh, CPR was cultivate, plant, and reap. So cultivate, we're developing relationships, planting seeds. Uh, so you're sharing what, the, what Christ has done for you. And then lastly, reap. Be prepared to share the gospel to the person in a meaningful way. And then I left you with the challenge to invite a seeker to church. And then two weeks ago, we talked about the believer. So these are children in faith. They're new believers, young believers, or perhaps tired believers. And Christ to them said, come and follow me. And he modeled the basics to them. So he modeled dependency on the Holy Spirit, obedience to the Father, and the importance of scripture, prayer, and worship. So the needs of these people are the basics. They need spiritual milk, and they need to learn how to walk, talk, speak, and feed themselves. Uh, and also they need to know their identity in Christ. So then some principles for ministry for the, for the believer is to give nurturance or model the basics and then to give reassurance of their identity, that is to encourage one another. And that was my challenge for you that week, was to go out and en encourage one another. Pray for someone who's been on your mind. Last week we talked about the worker. They are teenagers in faith. So rather than being me-oriented like the believer, they are now us-oriented. They look at to themselves, but also they start looking out to others. Uh, Christ to them said, take up your cross. And we read from Luke 10, 
uh, the account of sending out the 72 disciples. That's Christ's model um, of discipleship to the worker. Their needs, they need to be empowered. They have gifts, they need to be let go. Go use these gifts. You have energy, you have the wisdom, go and use it. Put it to use. So people need to be empowered if they're in the worker chair. And some principles, overall, they kind of boil down to endure. Endure, endure, endure. It's a hard chair, it's not easy, it takes time, and unfortunately not all make it through the worker chair. But it brings joy. So endure. And then my challenge to you that week was to get involved. So now lastly, we get to the friend chair. Now, a little disclaimer, I'm not actually following the same outline. I said I'd use the same outline for the whole time. I'm not. The reason why uh, these people, they've already learned the lessons of the other chairs. They don't have principles for ministry because they're at the last chair. Uh, their needs are basically the same as the needs of these people, but they know that. They've put a support system around them. They have help, and they know, they know the principles. So I'm changing up the outline. This week, I'm still going to talk about who they are. We need to define that first if we're going to actually talk about them. But then I'm going to talk about how. So how do, how do we know that we're actually in that chair? I talked about last week how the worker, not everyone makes it through that chair. So how do we know if we have made it through that chair? And then I'll also ask the question, why? So why should we strive to be in that chair? So this is my outline. Who, how, and why? So who? Who are the friends? Well. Obviously, they're the friends of Jesus. Uh, this comes from John 15. I said I'd be uh, referring to that a lot. So I'm just going to read a brief passage here. My command is, this is John 15, 12 to 15. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. So these people are friends because they're no longer servants. Uh, sorry. Uh, a servant, they often work out of obligation. They do what they do because they're told to do it. Whereas a friend, they work out of love. They love their friend, so they do the work for them. As a servant, if you're working out of obligation, you might start to feel resentful. Uh, resentful towards other people. So perhaps the worker might start to feel resentful towards other workers because they're not doing as much as them. Or perhaps they'll feel resentful to the believer because they're thinking, well, you've just been in that chair for a long time. Time to move forward. Come on. And they might start to build up resentment. Whereas the person in the friend chair, they're working out of love. Jesus is their friend. They see what Jesus was doing. They love Jesus, so they want to do the same. And they start to love the others, and they want to see the others progress. So the friends are friends rather than servants. They are also disciples who make disciples. So the friend is now a disciple of Christ. Uh, and they long to see others become the same. They've moved from the they move from the being me oriented or we oriented to just being others oriented. Like I said, they want they love the others now. They want to see them progress. They want to see them become disciples as well, and they want to see the kingdom of God grow. It's no longer about their interests, but it's all about the other now. And lastly, these people are radicals. Now you'll notice I put a question mark behind there. This is what Dan Spader said in his book, and I'm not, 
I'm not entirely sure if I agree with Ben Spader on this. He says that these people are radicals because he says, in short, that the person in this chair doesn't necessarily, um, he kind of goes against the church as an organization or as an institution. They don't really care for the church. Now, I don't really like that because there are lots of people in churches that are friends. They're in the friend chair. And once you get to the friend chair, you love the church. You absolutely love it. It's the bride of Christ. It's what we are meant to be. We are the church. So how can you be against something that you are? But you see, when you make it to the friend chair, you're not satisfied with just the status quo anymore. And so if you're not satisfied with the status quo, uh, you want to see the church grow. And in doing that, the person might push a little bit, try different things, and others perceive them as being the radical. So yeah, I think Dan Spader is kind of right in that this person can be perceived as being radical. It's not always the case, but it happens. So how do we know that we've progressed to this stage, to the stage of the friend? Like I mentioned earlier, the worker stage is hard, and we don't always make it through it. So how do we know if we've made it through the worker stage into the friend stage? I've kind of hinted to some of these already, uh, so it might be a bit repeat. But first off, love one another. Again, it's going back to the John 15 passage. You are my friends if you love one another. So if we're driven by love, that's how we know that we've made it to that stage. We're not being resentful towards others, but we want to see them grow. We don't force them through the chair, but we gently come alongside them, see where they're at, and help them along in their journey. Secondly, we know that we're in that chair if we're feeding sheep. Feeding the sheep. That's the John 21 passage that we heard from this morning. Now, I want to go back a bit to John 15. That one says, go and bear fruit in that passage. Uh, the vine and the branches, bearing fruit. Now, people often hear that passage and think it's all about evangelism. Go and bear fruit. And I know a lot of people, they think, well, I can't do that. That's great for the extrovert. Uh, it's easy for an extrovert to go out and talk to people and expand the kingdom of God and yeah, just grow the church. But I'm an introvert. I'm not great at that. I personally am an introvert, and I'm a little bit afraid of the John 15 passage, the go and bear fruit. Uh, now, I know it's more than just evangelism, but the John 21 passage, that one I can get on board with as, as an introvert. Feed the sheep. I can do that. It's kind of like shepherding take care, uh, just, yeah, watch over the sheep, help them out. If they're hurting, carry them for a bit. It's much easier to do that. I can get on board with that. But you see, there's a place in the kingdom of God for everyone. But feeding the sheep or bearing fruit, that's kind of how you know that you're in the next stage. You're doing work for the kingdom of God. And lastly, you know that you're in the friend stage if you follow me. This was the end of John 21. Not me as in me personally, but me as in Christ. I should make that clear. <laughs> uh, but uh, at the end of John 21, the passage that Glenn read for us this morning, Christ said, follow me. Kind of brings us back full circle. Some of you might be thinking, well, that was the, that was the invitation for the believer. It's also the invitation for the worker and the friend. It's not, following isn't just about aligning yourself like I've been suggesting the whole time. But following is about joining in the work that Christ is doing. And it also points to the idea that the friend does need to come back to the believer stage every now and again and refuel on the basics. They stay in the friend's chair, truthfully, but... The basics are kind of the foundation. So why? Why should we strive to be in the friend chair? 
This was my question the whole time as I was working through this series. Why should I try and be in the friend chair when it's so much easier to be in the believer chair and I'm still a Christian if I'm in that chair? Why would I want to do that? It's easy just being in the believer chair, soaking in the sp- and taking in the spiritual milk. The worker, that one's tough, so I don't care for that one either. I'm just going to stay there in the believer chair. That's kind of what I was thinking the whole time. But we do need to strive for the friend chair. And there are a few reasons why. First off, because that makes you a friend of Christ rather than a servant. When I think of it, I'd way rather be a friend. Who would rather be a friend than a servant? I see some people not raising their hands. Maybe they want to be servants. All right. So I've got some stuff to do at home with been working on a lot of projects, so why don't you guys come by my place later on this week, and I can put you to work then. I'd really rather be a friend than a servant. And as a friend, you end up being part of Christ's inner circle. Now, this kind of appeals to the more A-type personalities. You want to be in the know. But just so you know, this isn't uh, an exclusive club, this inner circle. We're all invited to be a part of this inner circle. But if you want to know what Christ's calling is on your life, if you're down here and you're thinking, I don't know what the purpose is, I don't know what Christ is calling me to, I just don't understand it, maybe try doing some work, get up to the friend stage, and I promise you, if you're here, you will know God's calling on your life becomes clear as day because you're his friend and Christ shares with his friends. In the John 15 passage, he said, I've made all, everything that the Father has made known to me, I have made known to you. You start to learn your purpose for life. And lastly, we want to be in, we, the reason for being in this chair is simply love. If you love God, you want to do things for Him. Now, I think of uh, my relationship with Melanie, or if you think of a relationship with your spouse, you want to do things for them. You don't just want to follow them and have people do them, or have them do things for you. You don't want to just do things for them out of obligation, but you want to do things for them because you love them. It's just plain and simple love. We want to do things for Christ because we love him. So if you love God, you want to be in the friendship. That's what you are longing for. You're striving for that. I want to leave you with a challenge like I always do. And the challenge is to feed the church. Now, I mean, when I say feed the church, I don't mean just do something for the church building or for the people in the church, although that might be the case, but do something for the sake of the kingdom of God. Do something altruistic. Being in the, cha- being in the friend chair is about being others-oriented. So do something altruistic in the name of Christ to further the kingdom of God. Go out of your way to do something for someone else. Now, I'm not going to tell you what specifically to do beyond that, other than feed the church. I know that God will bring something to mind if you are listening to him. And he'll put you in a scenario where you can feed the church. But my challenge is to, when God does bring something to mind, follow him. Listen to that Take a leap of faith. And my second challenge is to simply read Philippians. Now, this was in our Bible reading plan this week. But if you want to wrap your head around the friend a bit more, get an example. Read about Paul's life in Philippians. It's the perfect example of someone who's in the friend chair. So those are, uh, those are the chairs, essentially. And I hope that... 
you will be able to see how you can progress through the chairs if you're in one of the other ones, or how if you're in the friend chair, you might be able to help out others as well. And I hope that this is something that we as a church can do on a regular basis, is disciple one another. But we're going to uh, partake in communion right now, so I'm going to call up the worship team. And I'm actually going to give you one more challenge. And that's as we reflect on what Christ has done for us as we take communion, uh, let's also listen to him and reflect on what he is calling us to do. Think about which chair you are in and listen to God. How can I progress or how can I help others move into these other chairs as well? So Christ died on the cross for all of us. He took our sins away. And out of his love for us, he forgave us. And this is why we take communion, to remember the sacrifice that he made for us. And it's the least that we can do to choose and follow him, choose to follow him.